So a couple of the big takeaways that I have, and I think that most of us can see from what's been going on this morning is one, slowing growth. So, um, and Cindy really got into that component. Two is concentrated growth, which we saw along the I-25 corridor, aging certainly, migration and those changes to migration, as well as increasing race and ethnic diversity. And really what that comes down to um, is what we think as some fairly significant impacts to the future labor force and the economy. So slowing births, what are some of the implications of that? And we got some questions in the Q&A related to this, but I think it's some stuff that we wanna keep an eye on is one, the impacts to K-12. Um, our peak person that, we're that was born uh, is about 13 years old. And these are already kids that are having impacts in K-12 because we've seen fewer and fewer kiddos entering in at those younger ages. Um, obviously, as they, start to not enter higher ed, that's going to be an impact. And I will tell you that higher ed is already looking at this, um, has a very good idea. Again, if the peak person is 13, um, they've got about five more years before we start to see a slowdown in what you would consider that base group going into higher ed. And if you remember Nancy's slide, this has already transitioned from the East Coast. We've already seen a slowdown in the East Coast and the Midwest in, the, in terms of the kids under 18. And so they've already seen this downward pressure on higher ed. And I don't know if any of you've got kids that have been entering higher ed, um, but we know uh, that recruiting has changed in terms of trying to get kids into higher ed. And actually both of my kids were recruited out of Colorado because they were able to attend school out of state actually less expensive than attending school in Colorado. So I think that we've got some lessons to start looking at and start um, thinking about as we see this transition in the aging of our population and the fewer kiddos. Um, certainly the next phase would then be the labor force. And C Cindy brought that up in terms of the tightening of the labor force. And um, you know, if we think of factors of production, labor is one of those pieces that you can't necessarily go and build a new one, um, like a building or a machine. It takes a good 20 years to uh, birth them, raise them, train them, and bring them into the labor force. So it's going to be something for all of us to be thinking about is how do we use labor differently. Certainly consumption is then that next phase because 70% uh, of our economy is driven by consumer economy, by consumption. And so that's going to create transitions in our economy as well, as well as other things like housing demand. You know, they won't enter the age group that typically rents. They then won't enter the age group that typically buys. And so I think it's important for us to start thinking about those transitions. And I think a lot of us, what we can do is start looking at the East, especially Northeast, Midwest, to see how are they transitioning, because this is already happening across the United States. Um, certainly there's benefits and drawbacks from growth. We had a couple of questions come in through the Q&A about resource use and about, you know, where are some environmental constraints, water constraints in the future. And so certainly some benefits from this slowdown are resource use, looking at water use, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is something that could be beneficial um, in the future, certainly that we're going to be using resources differently. Um, but at the same time, on the drawback side is that so many of our public finance models have been built on a growth assumption. So thinking that, you know, growth will in in increase over time, looking at growth in sales, growth in employment, growth in sales in um, income tax, for example. And so also looking within our own system to see what models may need to be transitioned to understand how do we maybe do this more effectively into the future. And some states have already started looking at it. There's some material out there that I recommend looking at. I believe it's out of Iowa. We've got some uh, resources in our office that we can share called Smart Shrinkage. So it's really looking at developing plans where communities can be successful with no growth or declines. And also it might be redefining what success looks like. So many of us look at, for example, growth in GDP, growth in employment, growth in um, total sales. And we may start needing to be thinking about that in terms of better instead of more. And so changing up some of those metrics that we use to typically look at things, so maybe not increased employment, 
it may be decreasing um, poverty rates that would then look at in better instead of more. Likewise, we can look across the world. Cindy had mentioned some of the countries that have already been slowing down um, that may support families on the other end. Uh, you know, we've slow down in our births. Some of it actually also due to this fact that it's really expensive to have kids. Uh, so some countries are looking at family friendly policies that may make it easier to have kids, have a family. So looking at family leave, affordable daycare. So migration is this other component that I think we need to spend more time thinking about um, because certainly before COVID, we, we were getting a lot of questions in our office on, gosh, do we really need more people? Do we want to have migration? And what I'm gonna suggest is that we're gonna be actually faced with the other side of the coin in that it may be more and more difficult to attract people to Colorado. And I think we saw that moving into 2019. One of the questions that um, had come up on the chat was that, you know, what do we think has led to the slowdown in that, in that migration in the recent years? And I actually think it has to do with competitiveness of Colorado. Our prices had increased and so, um, I think we became a less competitive state to operate in, and we needed to, we need to be able to be thinking about that. Um, so pre-COVID, it was a very tight labor market. Post-COVID, we expect a very tight labor market. Cindy talked about that. And I think we need to be thinking about how, again, do we continue to attract and retain? And, it, and I want you to think about it in terms of retain as well. It's not just bringing in migrants, but also how do we retain our own population? And some of that is gonna be looking at more effective policies in terms of affordable health, um, housing, affordable health care, daycare, as, as well as looking at the entire you know, recreation and tourism that keeps people in the state. One point I wanted to bring up and it kind of ties to some of the work that Nancy brought up is looking at this balance between housing unit and population growth is that we've seen a disequilibrium over time. Uh, the, red, the orange bars in this graph are um, job or uh, housing unit growth. So each like year we build more houses. The dashed line is household formation and we have not done a very good job in terms of uh, combining those two, making sure that they grow in tandem or in parallel. I know a lot of it, it has to do with the fact that it's really hard to develop housing, start and stop. And so some of those indicators may not be out there that easily lead to it, but we can see over time, especially recently, basically since about 2007, that we were growing households at a much higher rate than we were growing housing units. And some of that has to do with demographics. You know, we've got this aging that we're going through. We are also have, you know, the millennials aging out of rentals into housing units or aging out of your basement and into housing units. And so we've seen this increased demand for housing um, in terms of households, but not as much of an increase in the housing unit. So we've seen uh, a, a real tight housing market, which has pushed up price. Next piece that I'd like to talk a little bit about is this concentrated growth. Um, we've seen this concentrated growth kind of almost historically, but especially recently, especially since 2010, where we've seen about 95% of our population growth, as well as about 95% of our job growth along the front range. A lot of that has to do with the industries that we have growing, but I wanna take a, a break and think during this time period of the recession, and we're looking at recovery strategies and we're looking at getting back to normal, is just even ask our question, ask ourselves, do we want to get back to normal? Is this a place that we want to be at? Um, are we um, happy with where we were? Or do we want to look at other strategies? A lot of people have brought up um, access to broadband, potentially looking at telework. And certainly, I think that that is something that we could and should be looking at. But also remember that all of the same constraints that we had pre-COVID still exists. There's probably not a place in the state that doesn't have a housing issue. And so even if we look at, you know, even in the resort region, a lot of those folks end up staying up there permanently, housing was already super tight. And what does teleworking from the resort region mean? Even in, you know, more rural Eastern Plains, San Luis Valley, even though you don't necessarily think about those areas as like second homes or 
for teleworking necessarily. If folks made that choice, do we have the housing, daycare, and broadband to actually really make that happen? And I know a lot of states, a lot of parts of the state are working on their broadband plan, but it's not fully built out necessarily across the state. Also want to talk a little bit about aging because again, Cindy brought that up and did a great explanation of what's going on, but really thinking about what this has to do with uh, the labor force. Again, it's our fastest growing age group is the 65 plus, huge impact on consumer spending. And that's why we've seen all of this job growth in um, healthcare and in eating out. If you look at consumer expenditures, that's where you see it. Um, growing jobs in those areas, a lot of them high wage and low wage areas. Also, the retirees as they're aging are gonna be aging out obviously of the workforce and that's gonna create a huge demand for additional workers. We're forecasting about a million folks aging out of the labor force just in this 20 year time frame. Uh, be actually between 2010 and 2030. So uh, we're halfway through that time frame. So we'll see a lot of people aging out, which again will create this increased demand for workers. And the question is, where are they gonna be coming from? Um, are we going to be able to migrate them in? Are we going to educate them and, and create them from within our uh, community? Are we going to be uh, migrating them from other states? Likewise, as I'd mentioned before, I think we're going to be becoming more racially and ethnic, or we're going to become more age diverse within the labor force as well. And I think this chart that uh, Cindy's created really gets at um, that, that feel in terms of folks aging out, growing at a much faster rate than folks aging into the labor force. So this shows growth rate by age group between 2020 and 2030, um, broken down really by the concept of labor force, whether you're a prime worker or aging in, aging out. And again, gets to this point that we are, um, we're aging fast and we're growing slow at that young end. So we're gonna be seeing this increased demand for workers, um, growing jobs as well as retirements. And again, the question gets to migration and where are they gonna be coming from? Are we gonna see this tightness? Um, and so you've got two choices. You can either migrate them in from other out of state or out of country, or you can also do work to increase Increase your labor force participation rates within the state. Um, and I'm going to suggest that we're probably going to need to look at both strategies, both how do we keep people as well as how do we do a better job of increasing labor force participation rates within the state and really looking at the young population, the old population, the in-between population, the males, females, people of color across the board that we need to be looking at these strategies. And when I say young, I'm not saying child labor law you know, regulations or anything. It's, it's those that are kind of the 16 plus. We're also becoming more racially and ethnically diverse and this tie, uh, ties directly into the labor force as well. Cindy's got some great charts showing that growth at our young end and that's where we're seeing it. Largest entrance to our labor force are gonna be people of color. A couple of the things that I think that um, we can take advantage of from COVID is that even on the education realm, I think that maybe we might see an increased access to education because of what we've done with COVID, because of things like this, because of webinars, access to education may actually be increasing and create more opportunities to create education, whether it's a certificate or a college degree, it could be anywhere in that spectrum, but giving people the opportunity for education and work potentially at the same time. But I think we also need to keep in mind, and another person had you know, kind of asked this question earlier, is that our people of color have especially been more adversely affected by COVID. And I think that's some area for policy that we should probably follow up with within the state. So with that, gives you some thoughts to be thinking about. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna to get to some Q and A. Um, and I am, I think I, we're gonna try and do this jointly between um, Cindy and me looking through the questions that we see there. Um, I will start with 
one, and it kind of uh, it kind of gets back to a little bit more of what Cindy was talking about. Uh, comes in from Heather. Drought and heat are going to have an impact on population and the economy. How are you taking these factors into account? What data sources are available for those of us that are doing these kind of analyses? Cindy? So there have certainly been quite a few studies done by demographers looking specifically at climate change and what I think those implications may be uh, for the population as a whole and how they move Matt Hauer is one uh, who worked with us. We participate in a group called the uh, FSCPE or, or the Federal State Cooperative for Population Estimates and Projections. And that's how we first met Matt. Um, but he's gone on to do a few different analyses. And so to look at, at those particular studies, one of the points that was of interest to me is Colorado is, is in that analysis listed as a net gainer. Uh, in terms of total population, just not as much as, as one might assume, as, as some of the big gainers from, from cl uh, climate change would be those counties who might be most impacted in terms of movement from perhaps the coast inland just a little bit. And so certainly uh, reach out to us anytime because we certainly watch and, and read all of those studies that are out there and, and can give you a list of the ones that that we know of. Perfect, thank you, Cindy. Um, looking at some of the different questions. Um, this is actually, this one uh, probably for any of us, uh, maybe Nancy uh, as well. When you look over it, at trends over the past decade, is there a high frequency metric that tracks closely to observed population growth. For example, do you use anything related to housing starts or labor force? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so Elizabeth had just put up the chart showing housing units and households. And in some places you could use housing units as one of those high frequency indicators of where people are. But as you notice, there can be a lag that housing development may not always be tied to housing growth and vice versa. That as we noted before the last recession, which was partially caused by overbuilding housing, that we were building housing and there wasn't the population growth. Then population continued to grow, but there was, uh, no incentive to build houses. So those sometimes can work. And in some counties where housing growth has been very consistent, that might be useful. Um, jobs is another indicator that where there are jobs, there are going to be people, um, depending on what that unemployment rate is. But in some ways you kind of hit on two of the things that really do track to population, jobs and housing, but in different ways. And then I would just add uh, one more to Nancy's list. Absolutely. And you talked about the jobs and certainly the one that I watch closely in terms of in migration to the state is our rank in unemployment. So that's sort of what I look at in terms of our competitiveness index with other states and how we're ranking. So when we rank really low in unemployment, we know our yeah, low in unemployment, we know we've got folks moving into the state. And when we've got one of the higher unemployment rates in the nation, we do not. And so that's that's one I watch closely does, is not effective at, in 2020, but <laughs> moving forward, I'm assuming it will be again. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so Brian, our friend Brian Lewandowski asks, uh, has your team tried to quantify the impact of tax policy on migration to or from Colorado and within Colorado, for example, uh, did the salt my uh, did the salt change measurable impact on migration? So that was the change in tax policy, um, really impacted, for example, New York, a lot of the East Coast states, um, and you know I'll put my two cents in. Um, yes, I think it did. 
Um, are we able to measure it? We'll try. Um, we haven't been able to see anything yet necessarily. New York has always, as Cindy had mentioned, New York has always been a large donor state. And so it continues to be a large donor state. And uh, the data that we get is a little slow getting from it. So like the last date that we have is 2018. So I think we'll continue to try and measure that over time. I think that's a, it's a really good question. And obviously one of the you know good reasons, I think why you see, for example, a lot of people um, move out of states to like even Colorado, like to Florida. I think Florida is a high, is a popular state. Nevada can be a popular state. Again, based on those tax policies um, that can attract people. Uh, and especially, I think, you know, I think your uh, comment is really appropriate, Brian, in terms of looking at that remote work. Um, we've had some people ask questions, you know, could I just move to Florida and remote work from there? Um, say that I'm working there 50% of my time, uh, yet my job is in Colorado. So I think we'll continue to see some of those implications over time. Um, and Aunt Nancy or Cindy, if you want to read any questions that you have a favorite, I'll, I'll do a last one and then I'll maybe turn it over to Cindy to ask questions. I will um, answer this or ask this one from Jack. Uh, do you think that the replacement of a broader range of jobs by technology and automation will change what's needed from the workforce participation point of view? Either of you guys, and if not. Okay, well, I'll jump in, because uh, certainly I think absolutely that is one of those, and I had it listed as a risk to the forecast, just in terms of automation. And so I know Chris and I had these many conversations just thinking about tourism moving forward and some of the automation that may be employed in terms of, of making your ski resort visit more contactless. You know, so being able to flash a badge to get in, in line for a ski run as opposed to having somebody there checking it. And so certainly that would put some downward pressure in terms of the numbers of jobs that are out there. And that it's, it is, it's a big question. So with our model being that labor balance idea, and we see that uptick in migration following 2025 to fill those jobs that we have folks retiring from, well, if the job goes away to automation at the same time somebody retires from it, then certainly we no longer have uh, the need for that position to be filled, but it's more likely than not that what we've seen from automation in the past is that it, it drives job growth in different types of industries. And so it's making sure we've got the prepared labor force to move into those different positions that, that may exist as a result of some of the automation that could take place. I hope that answered it. If you want to add, Elizabeth. No, actually, I think that you brought up really good points. And what I would suggest is that, you know, I think we're going to need automation in this uh, mix because I think the labor force is going to really get so tight that if we can automate those things that don't require as much person to person contact, um, that it will be better and that, you know, we'll kind of leverage what we're really good at, which is, you know, advanced communication and, you know, be able to automate those pieces that we can and that will help us again, uh, meet our labor demands, uh, but at the same time, um, be productive as well. And so I think we'll see some of that. And I think we'll see some of that actually even due to COVID, the automation of a lot of things. And I, I will do just one minor, like anecdote, um, you know, I think healthcare is actually where we're going to see a lot of improvements in efficiencies. And I won't say necessarily automation, but the being able to use a, a tool like a webinar to address some health needs will be very helpful in terms of being able to specialize, you know, like doctor patient contact and minimize, you know, maybe having to have somebody at the front desk to check you in. Um, so I, again, I think that there's some things that we'll be able to leverage uh, from all of this. One a question, and actually I think maybe Nancy, this one uh, you might be able to answer and Cindy, might, you might have some uh, feedback on it as well. 
It's from our friend John. Um, are you anticipating any demographic shifts resulting from the rental housing situation with so many tenants facing challenges in meeting rental payments? Any thoughts, Nancy? Otherwise, I'll turn it to anybody can answer or I'll answer if nobody else wants to. Assuming that, assuming that a lot of these, the current situation of people not being able to pay rent due to this recession due to the pandemic, um, and because that's nationwide, it may not uh, result in too many shifts state to state if the recession is equal across the country due to the pandemic. Anyone else? <laughs> You know, I think um, we'll see a couple of things occur um, with the rental market as a whole. I mean, I'm hoping, you know, I've been listening to as many sessions on the housing market and the rental market and what's happening in terms of relief for, you know, um, evictions versus trying to come up with deferment and payments. You know, I think that there's a big effort on part of both the state as well as local governments, as well as just individual owners, trying to keep people um, in housing as, as much as possible. Um, but knowing that there are, you know, eviction possibilities out there, I think the other challenge with it is that there's also this huge demand for housing. And it's not just a demand for single family ownership. It is even a demand for rentals because people are moving still from place to place. And we're seeing an increased demand again, even for Colorado. Um, I think you could see a shift of folks from people to renting to doubling up. And we've seen that historically. We can also see people um, back to the parents' basements. Um, but I think that um, big, big picture long run, that we won't necessarily see a huge a demographic shift. Um, I know a lot of people are talking about death of the city um, and that people are gonna be exiting the big cities. And I was listening to a really good podcast or a webinar last night and said that we might see a little bit of a slow, you know, a little bit of tenant, you know, hesitancy about big cities but that they don't assume death of the city at all. So even though, for example, like Denver's got 50% of its housing units are for rent, that we don't see death of Denver. Um, and if you talk to anybody from any of the coast, they'd say uh, Denver's not a big city. So it's only for those of us that are podunks from Colorado that see Denver as the big city. Anything else that you'd like to uh, add, Cindy? No, I think that sums it up. Thank you. Perfect. So with that, um, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to get to all of the questions. You guys have been pretty prolific uh, in, in writing. Um, we are going to now break for lunch. Um, and we will actually be giving you about a, a little bit less than a 45 minute break, coming back online at 12.45. And, Again, if we didn't get to all of your questions now, what we're gonna do is um, write answers to them and we'll be posting them with the meeting material that will be available or that is available on our website. So again, thank you very much. And now back to the groovy uh, break music and we'll see you at 1245. Thank you.